Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. Tonight, I invite you to explore with me another series of historical stories. A few months ago, we explored a story about gemstones in general. In it, I told you two stories about famous gems, like the Kohinoor diamond. Tonight, we're going to explore the stories of other famous diamonds, such as the Hope Diamond and the Cullinan Diamond, also known as the Star of Africa, which is a fragment of the Cullinan. And even though it is not a gem, I'll tell you the story of the affair of the diamond necklace, or the affair of the queen's necklace, a scandal that happened in France a few years before the revolution. This scandal contributed to ruining the reputation of Queen Marie Antoinette. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish to, you may close your eyes and forget about any worries as we embark on this adventure together. Also, we created a Patreon page for those of you who wish to and can support this project and get more of it. If you join, you will get various new things like the possibility to listen to all episodes with and without background sounds and regular bonus episodes. There are three stories that are only available to our Patreons, which include The History of Glass and Stained Glass, The Mysterious Story of the Man in the Iron Mask, and our most recent one, The Life of Frida Kahlo. And we will continue to add more. You will be able to download all these audios and you will also have your say on the choices of topics, advanced releases, and updates on upcoming episodes. We hope to see you there soon, so that we may continue developing Lights Out Library, which we do enjoy so much. You will find links in the description box and the first comment pinned under the video. If you fall asleep and wish to resume the video later, or jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are also listed in the description and pinned in the first comment, as well as links to different streaming options like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, which may be better suited for you. But before we begin, Assume a comfortable position. Take a long, deep, relaxing breath. When you exhale, release the tension in your shoulders, your neck. Release the tension in your facial muscles, too. And allow the sound of my voice to guide you through this journey. Let's begin our exploration with the story of the Hope Diamond. This tale will take us from India to France, to the United Kingdom, and finally to the United States. If one day you visit the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., one of the most famous pieces in its collection that you will be able to see is the Hope Diamond. It's not the largest diamond in the world. It is the size of a walnut and weighs 45 carats or a bit more than nine grams. One carat is a fifth of a gram. We will discover much bigger diamonds later. However, the Hope Diamond is one of the most famous, if not the most famous, diamond in the entire world. And why is that? First, because of its color. It's a blue diamond. It's made of carbon, like all diamonds, but it contains traces of boron, which gives it its particular color. Its clarity and purity are exceptional. However, there are other almost perfect blue diamonds. 
What makes it particularly famous is its legacy and history. It changed hands multiple times, and these hands were famous. To explore all this, we need to go back in time, more than 300 years. Our story begins in India. The Hope Diamond is a Golconda Diamond, meaning that it comes from a mine that was in the territory of the Golconda Kingdom in modern India. This is in the state of Andhra Pradesh in the southeast of India. The mines of Golconda produced some of the biggest, purest, and most famous diamonds in the world. As soon as Europeans established contact with India by sea, they opened direct trade between the Indian states and Western Europe. The extraordinary gemstones that existed there excited the appetite of kings, aristocrats, and collectors. Together with spices and precious fabrics, Indian diamonds began to reach Europe. Not just extraordinary diamonds, but stones of all sizes and qualities that European gem merchants sought. Sometimes these merchants were also thieves, because many diamonds were extorted or looted in military expeditions over the centuries. The Hope Diamond first appeared in the hands of a French merchant, who had made several trips to India. His name was Jean-Baptiste Tavernier. The exact origins of the stone are unclear. Perhaps it had been found long before, but it was acquired by him in 1666. He went to India, bought or obtained diamonds, and brought them back to France to sell to his clients, very wealthy individuals or jewelers. Throughout his journeys, he brought back dozens, possibly hundreds, of stones that would be cut in Paris. In 1669, three years later, he sold the diamond, along with dozens more, to the most prestigious client possible in France, and one of the heaviest buyers of gems at the time, Louis XIV, the Sun King. In 1669, Louis XIV was still young and on the rise. His influence was growing, his wealth was immense, and he had begun to spend it on building the Palace of Versailles. He accumulated collections of art and commissioned expensive furniture, paintings, jewelry. Extraordinary gems were like trophies that kings would add to their crown jewels, scepters, crowns, and jewelry in general. They did this for pleasure, for their taste for luxury, and, beyond that, to display their wealth and power. Louis XIV bought the future Hope Diamond and many smaller stones for the equivalent of 147 kilograms of pure gold. That is to say, more than 300 pounds. I say the future Hope Diamond because at the time it was very crudely cut, in just a triangle shape, and it weighed more than a hundred carats, more than twenty grams, that is to say more than twice its current size. Ten years later, Louis XIV commissioned the court jeweler to recut the diamond, a necessary process to make diamonds symmetrical and give them facets that reflect light, making them much shinier. The stone was cut once again to a weight of 67 carats, only about half of its original size, but still 50% bigger than today's. It was mounted on a cravat pin that Louis XIV wore during ceremonies. The diamond was now the size of a pigeon egg, still quite big for a diamond, and the consensus was that the recutting was a success. It was described in accounts of ceremonies as breathtaking. 
reflecting light in bluish-gray rays. It became known as the Blue Diamond of the Crown of France, or simply the French Blue. It stayed in the royal collection of crown jewels for a century. In the decades following the recutting of the diamond, Louis XIV's situation became less favorable. His early wars had been successful, but they were succeeded by longer conflicts against large coalitions of enemies. These wars became more deadly and expensive, but inconclusive, to the point that some of the king's treasures had to be sold to support the war effort, or at least to show that he was participating in it. For example, an entire set of furniture made of silver for the Palace of Versailles was sold, but not the French blue, which symbolically had to stay in his property for reasons of prestige, because it was already famous. When Louis XIV died in 1715, the diamond remained part of the crown's jewels. Decades passed without affecting its fame as one of the biggest and most perfectly cut diamonds in the world. In 1747, the diamond was remounted on an extravagant pendant by Louis XIV's successor, Louis XV, and the new king had it placed on his Order of the Golden Fleece pendant. The Order of the Golden Fleece is an order of chivalry that was founded in the late Middle Ages. It became purely honorific with time, and it actually still exists today. It has split into two branches, an Austrian branch and a Spanish branch. Membership was and still is awarded to aristocrats associated with the Habsburgs and the Bourbon families and to other sovereigns, the Emperor of Japan or the Queen of England are Knights of the Order. At the time in the 18th century, Louis XV had been made a Knight of the Order because of the King of Spain, who was Grand Master of the Order, was his relative. So Louis XV had the diamond remounted to be the centerpiece of the pendant showing his belonging to the order for ceremonies. Apart from the French blue, it contained a big red spinel, a semi-precious stone shaped like a dragon, and dozens of smaller diamonds. After the death of Louis XV, the diamond became the property of his grandson and successor, Louis XVI. However, there were other crown jewels, and the piece fell into disuse. The new queen, Marie Antoinette, often had crown jewels reset in new combinations for her personal adornment, but the French blue was not one of them. It remained with other gemstones in the vault. Then the French Revolution happened. The crown jewels were kept with precious furniture in a royal storehouse in the center of Paris. At the beginning of the Revolution, there was an attempt to maintain the monarchy as a constitutional monarchy. So the sovereigns were brought back from Versailles to Paris. However, then, war began with neighboring countries. Louis XVI tried to escape to reconquer his kingdom from the outside but was captured and imprisoned. The country was falling deep into civil war and facing wars on its frontiers as well. A new government took critical measures that would later be called the Reign of Terror. In this chaos, thefts and looting multiplied. In 1792, a group of thieves broke into the royal storehouse and over several days they stole most of the crown jewels. Many of them were recovered later, but not the French blue. It disappeared from history for twenty years. Twenty years after this theft, 
as the Napoleonic Wars were still raging, a blue diamond appeared in the hands of a London diamond merchant. We are now in 1812. The diamond was smaller than the French blue, at 45 carats versus 67 carats for the French blue. However, blue diamonds of that size in Europe were very rare at the time. The French blue had disappeared, and the odds were that this was the same stone with a new cut. There was always some doubt, which was lifted only much later in the 2000s, when precise sketches of the French blue were discovered in archives. The diamond, as it was in the 18th century, was reconstructed in 3D computers. It was proven that this diamond, which would soon be called the Hope Diamond, was indeed the French blue, because it fit very tightly around the whole diamond, too tightly to allow for the existence of a sister stone of that size. What happened to the diamond between the theft in Paris and the year 1830 is unclear. It was obviously recut, but we don't know when or by whom. We don't know whether it was smuggled into the UK immediately or whether it traveled across Europe first. However, it is entirely possible that it was acquired by King George IV of the United Kingdom when it arrived in London. Not as a crown jewel, because there would be records of that, but personally. Later, it could have been stolen or sold discreetly, cover the many debts that the king left when he died. In any case, except for this merchant who owned it in 1812, there are very few traces of what happened to the diamond between 1792 and the 1830s. If the British royal family owned it at some point, it did not retain it, and the stone ended up in the hands of a London banker named Thomas Hope, who paid for it. After 1839, the diamond can be traced much more closely, thanks to various records and sources. In 1839, it appeared in a catalog of the gem collection of Thomas Hope's brother, Henry Philip Hope. The diamond was now set in a simple medallion, surrounded by many smaller white diamonds. That same year, in 1839, Henry Philip Hope died without children, and his three nephews fought in court for over ten years over his inheritance which was finally split into three parts. One of them got the Hope Diamond. Its fame rose again in 1840s and beyond, even though at the time it was unclear whether this was a French blue or an entirely different diamond. Nonetheless, it was an object of scientific curiosity, and crowds were excited to see it. Most of the time it stayed in a bank vault, but it was displayed in 1851 in London at the Great Exhibition. The Great Exhibition was the first international exhibition, also known as the Crystal Palace Exhibition, which started the tradition of World's Fairs. It also appeared in 1855, four years later, at the following World's Fair in Paris. The diamond stayed in the Hope family for another 50 years, but the family's fortune was declining. In the 1890s, the owner was Francis Hope, and he met and married an American musical theater actress and singer named May Yohei. She had an international career at the turn of the century, having begun her career on stages in New York City and Chicago. However, she gained fame on the London stage, and she wore the diamond, or maybe a replica for safety. It's not exactly known. In 
on several occasions. The story might make one think that she was financially supported by a millionaire husband, but it was actually the other way around. Francis Hope, who owned the diamond, was ruined and had accumulated debts that he could not repay. The will of his ancestors prevented him from selling the stone. It was years before he could obtain permission to sell it, and in the meantime, he was supported by his wife. When he could finally put the Hope Diamond up for sale in 1901, she had run off with another gentleman. So Francis Hope sold the diamond to a London merchant, who then sold it to another dealer based in New York City. This is how the Hope Diamond crossed the Atlantic to America. It had spent the 17th century in India, the 18th in France, and the 19th in Great Britain. Since the 20th century, it has been in the United States. However, in 1908, it returned to Paris for a short time because, after it arrived in New York City, the diamond was sold again to a Turkish collector possibly on behalf of the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, but this is uncertain. What is documented is that the diamond briefly returned to Paris, where it was bought by a famous jeweler, Pierre Cartier, a member of the Cartier family, whose grandfather had founded the Cartier Jeweler House. Two years later, Cartier sold it to a wealthy American couple from Washington, D.C., the McLeans. The McLeans were as elite as one could be in America at the time. They both had personal fortunes, and the husband, Edward McLean, became the owner of the Washington Post a few years later. The wife, Evelyn McLean, was a mining heiress and a socialite. They acquired the gem in 1911, and it was during this period that the Hope Diamond began to acquire its reputation of being cursed, supposedly because many of its previous owners had met tragic fates. It is not entirely impossible that the McLeans themselves fabricated this supposed curse for publicity and maybe to increase the value of their investment. And in any case, for 36 years, the Hope Diamond remained in the hands of Evelyn McLean. She wore it on many social occasions, surrounded by elaborate security precautions, because it was one of the most valuable gemstones in the world. However, the stone was not stolen during her ownership. Evelyn McLean died in 1947. The diamond was then sold to settle her debts in 1949 to another famous jeweler, Harry Winston. He was both a good businessman and an artist jeweler who redesigned a lot of old jewelry and set large gemstones into more contemporary styles. Almost ten years later, Harry Winston donated it to the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., in the hope that it would help the United States establish a gem collection. He also donated another major diamond, the Portuguese diamond, which is a huge white or clear diamond of 127 carats more than twice the size of the Hope Diamond. And this is how the Hope Diamond ended up in Washington, D.C., after centuries of travels and tribulations. And maybe even more than what I just told you, because we have no trace of it before its appearance in India in 1666. But maybe it was found earlier. Now, I also told you that at the beginning of the 20th century, the diamond began to be surrounded by mythology, a 
curse. It was said to bring misfortune or tragedy to people who owned it or wore it. A claim appeared in the press that it had been stolen from the eye of a statue of the Hindu goddess Sita. These were mere rumors, actually. They were, and still are, entirely baseless. And from this theft in India, the curse would have been born. This type of legend was very popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. You have probably also heard of the curse of Tutankhamun, and what they have in common is that they use a few facts, which could actually just be coincidences, or they are twisted to fit the narrative. They add more facts that are just fabricated, and this ends up building a catchy story. If we take a look at the owners of the diamond, the first one was Jean-Baptiste de Vernier, the merchant who bought it from India. This trade actually made his fortune, and he died at 84, a very old age at the time. Then there was Louis XIV, the Sun King. After acquiring the stone from Tavernier, he had 47 more years of reign, with a few lows but also many highs, and he died at 76. The next wearer was Louis XV, who died at 64, long after wearing the diamond. Then we have the first individuals who ended in tragedy, Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette. They were guillotined, beheaded, aged 38 and 37, respectively. But interestingly, at the time, the diamond stayed in a vault. There is no record of any of them ever wearing it. They probably saw it at some point once or twice, but might not even have touched it. After them, the diamond might have belonged to King George. It is not entirely sure. But he died in 1830, age 67, and his reign was not bad at all for the United Kingdom. Thomas Hope acquired it, and died at 62, shortly after buying the diamond. So maybe here we have the beginning of something. The diamond stayed in the family until Francis Hope, who became the owner in 1884, and it's true that he went through bankruptcy and was forced to sell it. But he survived this and died 40 years later, in 1941. When Francis Hope was the owner, it was worn multiple times by May Yohi, the musical actress. She also survived long after and died at 72, even though she fell into poverty in her later years. Then the Ottoman Sultan may have owned it indirectly via the Turkish merchant, but this is not proven. Indeed, the sultan lost his throne in 1909 and died nine years later. The Hope Diamond passed to Pierre Cartier, who made a profit reselling it and died 54 years later in 1964, aged 86. The ownership did not seem to affect the Macleans much either. They divorced in 1932, 21 years after the purchase. Evelyn McLean kept it, and she died in 1947, after 36 years of ownership. Then Harry Winston had it. He continued to prosper, and since he donated it to the Smithsonian Institute, which manages the Natural History Museum, the institution has only prospered, and the museum has gained attendance in part thanks to the diamond. So, of course, some of the owners had problems. Statistically, it has to happen. But it is hard to see a pattern here. If there was a curse, it seemed that it only worked for a few decades, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. I would be tempted to say that this scarce narrative was fabricated, 
with the unhappy fates of other figures vaguely linked to the ownership of the diamond. For example, it was argued that one of Louis XIV's mistresses, Madame Montespan, would have worn the diamond, and she ended up in disgrace. But there is no mention anywhere that she ever wore it. That would actually be impossible in public because she was a mistress, and at the time it was part of the crown of jewels. She certainly saw it when the king wore the diamond, like hundreds of other people, and that's a very loose connection. Disgrace was the fate of every single royal mistress, so that's hardly exceptional. Another disgraced figure during the reign of Louis XIV was the finance minister, Nicolas Fouquet, who was arrested and jailed for basically irritating the king because he showed off his wealth too much and mixed his own finances with the kingdom's. Not an unusual practice at the time, but as far as we know, Nicolas Fouquet never owned or wore the diamond. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were beheaded during the Revolution, more than a century later. But of all the owners, they were probably the least interested in the diamond and probably never thought about it. So, unless the diamond would have taken revenge for their lack of interest in it, it is also hard to see a curse at play here. So why did this curse legend emerge and remains famous to this day? Probably because it was encouraged by owners and former wearers of the diamond. I told you about the actress May Yohi. She tried to capitalize on her identity as the former wife of the last hope to own the diamond. She had misfortunes in her life, financial, sentimental, and professional. And sometimes she blamed the stone for it. In the 1920s, she starred in a forgotten movie called The Mystery of the Hope Diamond. The film added more characters who would have fallen victim to the curse throughout history during the French Revolution and the 19th century, but it was all fictional. Newspapers helped spread the story. It was exciting and it sold. But it was all rumors and insinuations. There was never any hard evidence to it. And then Evelyn McLean also added her own narrative, adding more names to the list of past owners like Catherine the Great of Russia. But it was entirely baseless. Now that the diamond has been with the Natural History Museum for decades and nothing has happened, the curse story tends to slowly be forgotten. But from time to time, it resurfaces in articles that examine the story to see what there is to it, and the conclusion is generally that there is not much, but it remains exciting. There is no doubt that the Hope Diamond is not just a remarkable gem. It has crossed centuries and has become a historical piece of great importance, which makes it priceless. Now let's talk about another mythical diamond. This time our story will begin in South Africa. This is the largest gem-quality rough diamond ever found, the Cullinan Diamond. Historically, India was a major purveyor of diamonds, but in the 19th century, and even more in the 20th century, it was eclipsed by South Africa, where extremely rich deposits were found. In the last decades of the 20th century, mines popped up and great fortunes were built, sometimes from scratch, thanks to a combination of luck, smarts, and opportunism. This was the case of Thomas Cullinan, who was born in 1862 in the Cape Colony. 
He was not the heir of a mining empire at all. He worked as a bricklayer in Johannesburg, like many others. When he could accumulate some money, he turned to prospecting. He was lucky to find diamonds at the time when there were places where they could be found on the surface. Transported with soil that had been washed from a diamond-bearing place, one day he found a diamond near a farm fence and detected that it must have come from a particular rock hill that existed nearby. He managed to buy the land, and this acquisition turned out to be a jackpot, a very rich diamond mine on which he built his fortune. It is there that the biggest known diamond find ever happened. In January 1905, a rough diamond wearing 3,106 carats, that is 620 grams or 22 ounces, was found 18 feet below the surface. This diamond was three times bigger than the previous South African record, the Excelsior Diamond, which weighed only 972 carats. There was no doubt that this stone had extraordinary value. It was so big and also of such good quality that it would be hard to sell. Many diamonds that are found are insufficiently perfect. They contain impurities. But this one was good enough to be considered gem quality. Shortly after the discovery, it went on public display at a bank in Johannesburg, where a few thousand visitors came to see it. Then it was deposited with a sales agent who would take it to London, where it could be sold. The trip from South Africa to England was long, and the diamond could have attracted thieves because it had become instantly famous. So a steamboat was staffed with detectives and a parcel that officially contained the stone was locked in the captain's safe and guarded throughout the entire journey. But it was just a decoy. The steamboat carried a fake, and the real diamond was sent to London in a plain box by mail. On arrival in London, it was carried to Buckingham Palace for inspection by King Edward VII. Initially, the diamond drew a lot of interest from potential buyers, and it was put on sale on the London market. But then nothing happened. The diamond was just too big for jewelers. Buying it meant that it would have to be split into different pieces. That was frightening because the cost of buying the rough diamond was huge. And at the time, no one was willing to take the risk. So it remained for sale for two years, until the Transvaal Prime Minister from South Africa suggested that the colony should buy the diamond as a gift for Edward VII, as a token of loyalty and attachment. And so it was done. The king accepted the gift, and the Cullinan diamond joined the British crown jewels. At this point, it was still rough and not much more impressive than a block of glass visually. It had to be cut, and a gem cutter from Amsterdam, where it was a specialty, was appointed. Again, the ship carried an empty box across the North Sea to Amsterdam to throw off potential thieves. The diamond traveled by ferry and train in the pocket of the gem cutter, who had discreetly traveled to London to receive it. Splitting a rough diamond of that size was very hard and challenging. For something of such high value, the size and shapes of different cuts must be anticipated to make the most out of it. The final cut and polished gems need to be symmetrical and look perfect. So before even starting to split it, 
sketches are made and the stone is studied from every single angle. Any bad move and millions in value could vanish. The splitting of the stone was planned for weeks until it was decided to make nine large stones out of it, plus almost a hundred minor brilliants and smaller diamonds. These nine stones have the numbers Cullinan 1, 2, 3, and so on. Each of them became a remarkable stone in its own right. The largest one is Cullinan 1, also known as the Star of Africa. It weighs 530 carats, which is more than ten times the weight of the Hope Diamond, and it has 74 facets. It was set at the top of the silver and scepter. To this day, it remains the largest clear-cut diamond in the world. Among cut diamonds, it was surpassed only by a brown diamond, the Golden Jubilee Diamond, in 1990, which was actually discovered in the same mine as the Cullinan. The Great Star of Africa is not completely perfect. It has very minor flaws, but they are invisible to the naked eye. For a diamond of that size, you cannot be too picky. The Cullinan II, sometimes called the second star of Africa, is a cushion-cut diamond. It is like a wide oval or rectangle with curved sides, and it was set in the front of the imperial state crown. It weighs 317 carats and is also one of the largest cut diamonds in the world. The Cullinan III is pear-shaped like a drop and it weighs 94 carats. It was sometimes worn by Queen Elizabeth II as a brooch together with the Cullinan IV, which is square and weighs 64 carats. And then there are five more. In all, splitting and cutting these diamonds took eight months, with three people working full-time on them to complete the task. The Cullinans are part of the British crown jewels. However, the seven following ones, which are less impressive but still of very high value, were inherited by Elizabeth II from her grandmother, Queen Mary in 1953. The Cullinan diamond also produced almost a hundred smaller diamonds and a set of fragments that remained unpolished. Some of them were also owned by Elizabeth II, while others have been dispersed and set into other jewels. Now, our third and last story of the night is not exactly about a gemstone but it is an adjacent topic that you often request, so let's do it. Let's explore the affair of the diamond necklace, which will take us back to France in the 18th century. Buckle up, because it sounds like a mix of crime thriller, farce, and soap opera, but it is real. It happened, and it was a huge scandal that sank the popularity of Queen Marie Antoinette a few years before the French Revolution. But the story actually begins before she became queen, in 1772, at the court of Louis XV. We already talked about him as one of the owners of the French Blue, the predecessor of the Hope Diamond. Louis XV always had mistresses. The most influential one during his reign was Madame de Pompadour, who was not born into the aristocracy, but acquired all the etiquette and codes of the court and became very influential, not just in politics. She also became a patron of the arts and protected philosophers. Her peak as the official chief mistress of weekends was when she was in her late 20s, from 1745 to 1751. 
But even after, she remained a friend of the king and an influential figure. As Louis XV advanced in his reign, he kept picking very young mistresses, typically in their twenties, who stood out increasingly for their looks and not necessarily anything else. In the last years of the reign, the mistress-in-chief was Madame du Barry. She was not well-liked, but even her detractors had to agree that she was extraordinarily attractive and beautiful. She had natural blonde hair and shaped blue eyes and a very bubbly, funny personality. When Louis XV noticed her, she was 25, and he was 53. At this point in his life, old and disenchanted enough to disregard her past, he did not mind that she was a courtesan, which is to say, a high-class prostitute. Her origins were very modest. She was the daughter of a seamstress and an unknown father. She moved to Paris and came to the attention of her high-class pimp, Du Barry who established her career as a courtesan in Parisian society. She built up her large aristocratic clientele, and occasionally she went to the court in Versailles, which is how Louis XV noticed her at first. She was charming and funny. She didn't have much culture at all, but her looks and her skill in bed apparently made up for it, and the king completely fell for her. By the beginning of the 1770s, she had had a very impressive social rise. Louis XV could not get enough of her, and even though a large part of the court despised her, due to contempt for her origins, behavior, and jealousy, probably especially Marie Antoinette, who was not the queen yet, the king continued to shower her with expensive gifts. In 1772, Louis XV decided to make her a very special gift, a diamond necklace that would surpass all others in cost, size, and splendor. The estimated cost was two million livres, which was a fortune, enough to build a palace or buy dozens of large houses just for a necklace. But jewelers would need several years to amass the appropriate set of diamonds. Two years after ordering the necklace in 1774, Louis XV died of smallpox, and Madame du Barry instantly lost her status at the court. Her sugar daddy was dead, basically, and she was immediately banished, never to be seen again at Versailles. When Louis XV died, he was very unpopular. But the new sovereigns, Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette, were very popular at the start. They represented change. They were young. They were good-looking. At least she was. After the very long reign of Louis XV, their ascension was seen as a new start. But the death of Louis XV was bad news for the jewelers. They had been working on this necklace in 1772 and had already spent a fortune on diamonds, but now their client was gone. So they approached Louis XV and Marie Antoinette in 1778, trying to convince the king to buy the necklace as a gift for his wife, but the sale did not happen. The reasons are unclear. It could be that Marie Antoinette was asked to keep her spending in check. France had just entered the American War of Independence. Money was tight. And spending on over-the-top jewelry was not a good idea politically. Or it could also be that Marie Antoinette knew that the necklace had been created for Du Barry, whom she very strongly disliked. But in any case, the jewelers were left with their necklace.
so they tried to place it outside France for three years. However, it was just too expensive. Again, in 1781, they tried with the queen, but she refused to buy it. Her early popularity had declined, and people now blamed her and her spending for the financial issues the kingdom was facing. This was quite unfair, because it is true that she spent a lot and lived in a bubble, completely disconnected from the reality of France. But on the scale of the state budget, her spending was not that significant, and clearly not the main reason for financial troubles. In any case, it was in this context, in the 1780s, that what would become the affair of the necklace began to fall into place. And it happened entirely because of two characters. The first was a woman, a confidence trickster, known as Jeanne de la Motte, who gravitated to aristocratic circles. She lived on a small pension but had an appetite for money and recognition that made her try to gain wealth and approach the royals by any mean possible. Jean de la Motte became the lover of our second character, the Cardinal de Rouen, now mistress of a cardinal. Something sounds off because cardinals are not supposed to have romantic and sexual relationships. But it was not uncommon in the 18th century for members of the church to live in the aristocracy, they didn't marry and were not supposed to have relationships, of course, but they could work as ambassadors or ministers. Some lived as courtiers. They were a very small minority within the clergy, but they were a part of social life in Versailles and Paris. De Rouen name was very prestigious. It was high in ancient nobility and the Cardinal of de Rouen had been an ambassador to the court of Vienna, the capital of Austria. But the Cardinal was in a state of disgrace, especially in the eyes of Marie Antoinette, because he had contributed to the spreading of rumors about her in Vienna. She was originally Austrian, and he had spoken ill of her mother. So, the cardinal was desperate to regain the queen's trust and favor. His new mistress made him believe that she had access to the inner circle of the queen, which was a lie. Marie Antoinette barely knew her, but she managed to convince him that she could help him regain the queen's goodwill. An elaborate scheme began to form in Jean de la Motte's mind. She was going to use the cardinal to execute it. She persuaded him that he could write to the queen and that she would pass the letters both ways. This was not true. She had no access to the queen, and when Rouen wrote letters, she began to reply herself. The tone of the fake letters became warmer and warmer, to the point that the cardinal ended up suspecting that the queen was falling in love with him. He begged Jean de Lamont to organize a secret meeting, which was tricky, but she solved it by hiring a prostitute, who looked a bit like Marie Antoinette. De Rouen had never approached a queen up close, and Jean de Lamont organized the meeting at night in a discreet part of the gardens at Versailles. The meeting took place. De Rouen totally believed that he had spoken to the queen, and Jean de la Motte now had him where she wanted. So she started plucking the chicken. First, she borrowed a large sum of money from him, pretending they were for the queen's charity work. Of course, she never delivered the money. She lived comfortably with it. One day, she saw the possibility of an even bigger operation. She contacted the jewelers, who were still trying to sell their diamond necklace in 1785. 
she told the cardinal that Marie Antoinette wanted to buy this necklace. But she needed to do it discreetly because buying such an expensive item in times of need would be politically clumsy. So she needed an intermediary and asked him to be this person on behalf of the queen. Jean de Lamotte forged letters to make the claim believable, and Theron completely fell for it. He negotiated the purchase for the sum of two million livres, the price agreed upon by Louis XV more than ten years earlier. She didn't have the money, but the necklace was to be paid for in installments. He showed the jewelers the fake letters made by Jean de la Motte as proof that the queen was behind the purchase. The jewelers also believed it. Jean de la Motte convinced him that she would deliver the necklace to the queen. Fully trusting her, Derouan gave it to her, more exactly to a man, at Jean de la Motte's house, who was made to believe was a valet for the queen. Of course, Jean de la Motte never delivered the necklace to Marie Antoinette. She just picked it apart and sold the gems on the black market. That story could not end there because the jewelers had not been paid and had made to believe that the queen was now the one who needed to pay. So, when no payment materialized, they complained to her, who had no idea all of this had been happening behind her back. This is how the scandal began to unfold. An investigation was launched, and the Cardinal de Rouen was arrested to his surprise. It took him time to realize he had been tricked from the start. Jean de la Motte was arrested shortly after, as well as the prostitute who had played the role of Marie Antoinette and an expert in forgeries. Jean de la Motte had hired this expert, who had written the fake Marie Antoinette letters for her. At this point, the scandal was already too big to be hidden and settled privately. So, to the king and the queen's dismay, a trial had to take place, which would expose all the events publicly. Public opinion in 1786 had turned against the queen. Even though she was objectively blameless in this scandal, people were ready to believe that she really had tried to acquire the expensive necklace. They suspected that the blame would be put on lesser people in a parody of a trial, despite findings to the contrary. The myth that the Queen had used Jean de la Motte as an intermediary to purchase the necklace became very widespread. Marie Antoinette, who was already unpopular, saw her reputation buried for good due to this affair. The Cardinal de Rouen was acquitted. He had been foolish, but not dishonest. He didn't go to jail, but he was still exiled from the court, and his name was stained. Jean de la Motte actually managed to escape from her prison and took refuge in London. Her life remained adventurous, and she continued her tricks she died five years later in London at the age of 35. She died as she had lived, trying to escape debt collectors by hiding inside her hotel. She fell from a window, injured herself, and died from these injuries. Two years later, Marie Antoinette was beheaded. This affair contributed in no small part to the popular hatred against her. Cardinal Deron fared better. He was completely disgraced and ridiculed. But three years after the scandal, their revolution began, resetting everything. He was an aristocrat and a cardinal, for reasons to escape France when the revolution turned more radical. So he went into exile, 
abroad in Germany, where he died in 1803 at the age of 68. This is how the affair of the diamond necklace ended, with the necklace destroyed and its gems dispersed. But we know what it looked like thanks to sketches and drawings made when it was designed and when the jewelers who made it were desperately trying to sell it. It was one of the most expensive and unique pieces of jewelry ever created. We've come to the end of our story tonight. I hope you enjoyed this exploration, and I invite you to discover and learn more. Now you can let go and sleep, or you can pick another story from our ever-growing library. And until we meet again, good night. Sleep well. <laughs>